I'm so glad you're here. This is our community, you know, and the neighbor that I want you to meet today is a very special person. She's a friend of mine as well, but she is the Soslin Curator of Modern Art at the Nelson Adkins Museum of Art, and her name is Jan Shaw. Hi, Jan. Hi, Mary. It's so good to be here with you. I am delighted. And we are going to talk about the, well, actually, it's a show at the Nelson, but it's even larger than that. It's the history of the art of the World War I era, and the Nelson has been um, very cognizant of the fact that we are celebrating the 100th anniversary of the commemoration of the war. And Jan has put together, I think, 60? You have 60? About 60 works of art, yes. Yeah, not all belong to the Nelson. No. So that's trouble to find all this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> but she has done a magnificent job. And um, are you ready to discuss art? Of course. <laughs> I, I, you know, um, the exhibit is interesting because it goes from corpses to tea, teacups. And, 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 I, and I think that it, that, that analogy um, is simply, um, part of the chaos that came out of that era between maybe 1890 and 19, 19, 19, 1920, somewhere around in there. Talk about the, the chaotic state of the world when these artists uh, were producing. Well, the late 19th century was, in general, throughout Europe and, and throughout America as well, a very dramatic moment of shift. And it had to do with the Industrial Revolution and what that did was to bring a lot of people into the cities, away from the farms. It upset the agrarian economy. It created a sense of alienation because people were apart from their families. All sorts of new inventions. You know, we went from horses and carts uh, to cars. We went from cars to airplanes in that amount of time, and it was very speedy, and it was very dramatic, and it very much upset the apple cart as far as what people's expectations were for their lives and um, it had political ramifications as well. You know, and that, I, I think, I want to pull out a little thread here. You talked about the instability of their families because of the Industrial Revolution and the changes taking place, and that was the beginning of the separation of families because before that, they all stayed, they worked together, they lived in the same town, they it, did their parents' business. I mean, nobody left. It was a, such a strong community, and for that to be shattered by the Industrial Revolution, and then the other thing that happened, of course, with the industrialization was that people went to work in these factories. There were no labor laws, so people worked extremely long hours mm -hmm. for very low wages, mm -hmm. and they began to feel really inhuman. They began to feel like they were simply cogs in the machine, which in effect they were. I was going to say And when they were, yeah. when anything happened to them, they were wounded on the job, or they were, they died. They were just replaced by someone else, well, and, and so know, there was, I was a disregard. I was reading something where um, women worked in a factory painting luminescent dials on watches, mm -hmm. and of course, you know that's radioactive. Radium. And they would lick the yep. end of the brush to sharpen it, yep. and they it was horrible, horrible. There really wasn't an awareness mm -hmm. as we have they today. I mean, we're still discovering things that need to be adjusted in the yeah. workplace, yeah. but back then there were absolutely no controls, no, and no. people were in, were dispensable. Well, and not only that, they lived in very squalid conditions. I mean, it was just bad. Yeah. So now we've kind of set the stage here, mm -hmm. but art, I always think that artists have a third eye and that they see the world sometimes before the rest of us do, and they interpret it, not standing on a soapbox in Washington Square, New York, but by their, through their art. Mm -hmm. So how did um, the war affect the art and the artists? Could you discuss that? I mean, I think that's so interesting. Well, the war itself affected the, the art world in, in specific ways. I mean, some of the artists, of course, had to serve in the war. Some volunteered, some were conscripted, uh, some had mental breakdowns, some were wounded physically, some died. So directly, the war impacted artists in many ways. Um, indirectly, all of the other aftermath and the response um, in their communities changed everything. When your country's at war, when your family is, when you are at war, yeah. physically you're in the trenches and you're worried about your family, it changes everything. Well, I, I think too that, um everybody was in upheaval. 
Yes. It was just a, everything was vibrating mm -hmm. at that time. And I, and I think that um, you made the remark that not since the Renaissance um, had there been such a watershed moment in art uh, as there was in the modernism. That's right. It was a major cultural shift. And I would say analogous to, perhaps more dramatic, but analogous to what we're going through with the industrial, with the information age. Shifting, it's a whole shift of mindset, which is changing the way we do business, changing yeah. the way we think, changing the way we interact all of those things. So it's very interesting that it's 100 years later we're going through a, com a comparable event. Well, my, my father event. always said, everything is circular. He always said, you sit in the same place for a while and they, it comes Absolutely. around again. Happens again. And I, and I think in different ways. It is true, but I, I think that um, I, I look at technology and I, and I think it's the same as the people here. I look at technology and I think, I don't understand that mm -hmm. at all. I mean, you know, you say hello to the techie people, and then I'm done. I don't know what else to <laughs> say. <laughs> but but uh, but I think upheaval causes art to be even more creative. It's interesting that um, people didn't see it coming. They didn't expect there to be a war. Nobody expected there to be a war. But we marched right up to it. Well, we did. And, and, and the archbishop, uh, the archbishop, the uh, archduke was not. You know, his death only was what the newspaper said precipitated the war. But the, we were on the road to war for a many, long time. many years beforehand. Yeah. There were all sorts of um, uncertainties and difficulties that were happening among various countries um, that were stirring the pot, shall we say? And that was just that kind of final excuse to jump into something. It was, mm -hmm. and I, and I think. Um, you use the word avant-garde, mm -hmm. which I which I think is interesting too because. That means the cutting edge. Mm -hmm. And there are always people that want to be, or that find themselves, by virtue of the fact that they're standing there, on the cutting edge. Mm -hmm. And these artists, I think, all of them in their own way, were on the cutting edge of that um, change to modernism. Absolutely. They certainly were. They defined what modernism would become known as and for. And it's interesting, though, uh, just to elaborate further on the term avant-garde, of course, it's a military mm -hmm. term. Yes. And it really was the, f the first forces, goes way back in time, but it was the, for the, group of, the group of the forces that went forward with their bayonets pointed, and they were on the outs, they were sort of scouting for what was going to happen next behind them and clearing the way. And in a way, that's, it was interesting that, that that metaphor would be used by the artists or by well, the critics. Let me ask you this question. How were the avant-garde artists received by the public in general at the time? I think people were completely confused, if they even knew about it, because there weren't that many of them, and they were exhibiting in small places. They weren't a major force. If the, if the general populace was even aware of them, they didn't get it. They thought they were a little strange. Well, certainly. <laughs> they, I mean, they'd had a little bit of lead up because yeah. of Impressionism and yeah. post-Impressionism, but that was even still beyond their oh, comprehension yeah. because it didn't conform to the way they, they understood the world. But the, what was happening with the artists is that they were responding to new ideas in science and mathematics and ideas about space and time and about ideas about the way the eye actually sees color in terms of rods and cones, which are you know, dots and dashes of color. Uh, and then the mind puts it all together. Was so the pointillus, that was pointillism. Yeah, yeah. And, then, uh, and then, but all of that leads into this kind of dissolution of the absolutely refined, configured reality. Well, it is true. And, 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 you know, I have found, too, that one thing kind of segues into another yes. and time marches on, as yes. they say. But I think if we look at the Kandinsky, mm -hmm. that, we're talking about the Blue Riders yes. here. And the Blue Riders school was um, probably on the forefront of that movement of modernism. They were one say? of the, they were definitely one of the, the forerunners of modernism. And their approach was expressionistic. It was very gestural. It was very colorful. It was intense. And it, um, as you can see in the Kandinsky painting here from 1909, 1910, and you actually see in the center of that painting a kind of abstracted horse, it's white, and you see a figure riding on it wearing blue, and that really b was in a sense the emblem of their, of their movement. Based in Munich, uh, Vasily Kandinsky, Franz Marc, and others, August Macke, and others were all part of that movement. And they actually had a really interesting notion about what the future would bring. They saw themselves as 
avant-garde, leading the way into this new world. And if you look at that painting, up in the left you see kind of a dark, kind of gloomy scene. They saw that as the world of now. And over on the right side, they are looking, you can see something, there's a church window, uh, stained glass window reference, and lots of color. And the idea was that Kandinsky envisioned that we were moving into a new spiritual era, a world of illumination and brilliance, away from the dark old way of looking at things. I'm not sure how correct and, he was. And, like and then, <laughs> no, what I'm saying is yeah. that, you know, yeah. in 1910, his vision was the dawn of a new spiritual era. Four years later, the world is at war and it's Bingo. a cataclysm. It was, mm -hmm. it was indeed. Well, the other, and I think, um, we had, um, he is no longer living, but a member of the Blue Riders in our midst because he, um, in the last part of his life, was um, uh, at the University of Kansas. And during, this is an Albert Block, and he is entirely different. And talk about Albert Block just a little bit, because I, I truly, this happens to be mine, I have to mm -hmm. say. And I just love that, because look at him. His name is Mephisto, by the way. Ah, mm -hmm. probably a character from the uh, cabaret, presented in that way, probably from a dramatic um, event that he that he captured. But Albert Block was American. Of born course, in St. Louis. Uh, yes, uh -huh. born in St. Louis, but of German ancestry. And so as a young artist, someone who uh, wanted to be where the action was, went to Munich and became affiliated with Mark and Kandinsky and Macke and the others who were part of the Blue Rider group, the Blaue Reiter, and uh, he was an absolutely integral part of it and documented the cabaret scenes and um, life in general as he saw it. And so the movie Cabaret would be sort of... Cabaret, that cabaret, the, that movie is really more about um, World War II, lead up to it? World yeah, War II. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But but I just I love that and I think most people don't know that we had this he's really very well known yes, artist indeed. internationally and he was part of the scene at the University of Kansas he had to leave Germany he had to leave not bec he had to leave once the United States entered the war so uh, he was there. 1914 the war began 15 16 he was still there 1917. Uh, when the, when the um, United States entered the war, he suddenly became an enemy combatant, right. and he then had to leave. And he also, beyond that, he was very concerned about the impoverished situation that he and his family were living in. By that time, he and his wife had a child, and it was not a good place to be. Well, and Mephisto was done in 1910, so he was mm -hmm. still in Munich yes. then. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was a German Impressionist. Interesting, the same year that Kandinsky painted the painting we just looked at. E exactly. And so I thought it would be interesting to look at both of them because mm -hmm. they're a little bit different, mm -hmm. but um, very, very um, expressive. Um, I think that, you know, as we move along, to the different schools of, of painting, we need to move to the Expressionists. Mm -hmm. And um, there is a Schiele at the gallery, is there not? Yes. Is he in the show? He is. We have an Egon Schiele in the exhibition. He was an Austrian artist mm -hmm. based in, in Vienna. And um, his approach to art was very figurative. He was not abstract in the sense that we just saw Kandinsky. Very figurative and kind of exploring the dark side of life. I remember the, the Sheila that I saw, I believe, is a, it's, it's gray and dark and it shows buildings. Oh, landscapes. He, was, he uh -huh. did a lot of landscapes and cityscapes yeah. as well. Um, the piece that's in the exhibition is uh, the figure of a woman seen from behind and she's partially nude. Uh, you know, I think it's also to note that Sheila died at 28, and yes. he got the flu. He, w he was in that horrible flu epidemic. Mm -hmm. He died mm -hmm. um, in 1918 or 19. Yeah, 18 or 19. 18, I think it was. So the in the influenza epidemic or pandemic, it really became, was really spreading like wildfire during that era, and um, it's called the Spanish flu. Interesting thing that I learned in this process <laughs> was that. The reason it was called the Spanish flu was because no one else would talk about it. They didn't want to admit that there was this horrible flu that was, and not just, you know, stomach flu. I mean, oh, this was, was horrible. Bad. And killed, My mother had it when she was very Killed millions small. of people. Mm -hmm. And nobody wanted to talk about where it started or how it began. And so the only paper, the only newspaper that would cover it was in Spain. <laughs> and then they for, therefore got the moniker of having it <laughs> called the Spanish flu. Sometimes it's not Just well because to they talk were the ones much. that publicized it. <laughs> they talked too much. They talked about it. But, but I think uh, there, there's another one that is in the show that 
and, and this came, I, you know, I knew about Marston Hartley, but I didn't, I never focused on when he painted. Mm -hmm. So he was in this era too, and I think you will see that the Marston Hartley is, is a, and I love these bright, bright colors. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, the, um, um, I, 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 does that mean anything to you? Well, I mean, sure. This is, uh, you know, this is, he's an abstract, ex excuse me, he's an expressionist artist. He's part of the, the um, Blauer Reiter a little bit, but more specifically, an expressionist artist who was based in Berlin. He was not in Munich with Kandinsky and the others. Mm -hmm. He was in Berlin, and yet he adopted and, and was part of that whole expressionist movement. And this painting is called Himmel, and you can see the word in blue with the stars there by it. Uh, mm -hmm. H-I-M-M-E-L means heaven in German. Mm -hmm. I al always have thought, why did he call it just Himmel? Because really it's about the dichotomy between heaven and hell, and the word that's upside down on white with red letters with the two little dots is Hölle, which in German means hell. So it's really heaven and hell. So we want to stay away from the bottom of the picture. Well, <laughs> it's, it's really about the situation there yeah. where I mean, you can see sort of bombs exploding and bursts, and, and this equestrian monument, was a, which is a kind of delicate reference to war, and also to the fact that his lover uh, was uh, conscripted into the German service and went off to war and was killed. It was, it was a not difficult a happy time. time but no. you see the artists interpret uh, life that, as they see it around them. Mm -hmm. And a lot of these um, paintings that you will see in the show are, you know, that you might find if you go to the internet, they have corpses in them and they're, they're really... Some do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, some do. And, and, and then others are like this and mm -hmm. you, you can read a lot into them. Mm -hmm. Let's move to the Bauhaus. Big jump. It is a big jump. They mm -hmm. are about, what, 1919? Yep, 1919, the Bauhaus opened in Weimar, Germany. This is post-war now. Uh-huh. Yeah, well, uh, not exactly, because the uh, Conference of Versailles was in 1919. Yes, and just 1919, yeah. and then in the fall of 1919, yeah. they were in the summer of 1919, and then yeah. the fall was uh, but the I, But I think that it's well to tie in history, because mm -hmm. the Conference of Versailles, and we might take a moment to remind you that it, it was at that point that the Ottoman Empire was destroyed mm -hmm. and the Middle East was created as we know it now. And Turkey was um, part of the, uh, they were the Ottoman Empire. So we had all of these uh, small um, states in the, in the Middle East created as a result of this that we are still having, as I might remind you, difficulties with. So mm -hmm. that was, well, Let's let's then talk about it. It was a school. Yes, it was. Uh -huh. And see, I think we don't we, we we mustn't call it a movement. We have to understand mm -hmm. that it was a school and that they taught design, they taught fine art, they had classes. Absolutely. And I I think that um, this is where I want to show you a, a beautiful set of cups. They're silver. It's a tea service, and. Let's take a look at those because mm -hmm. we're. I, I think those are absolutely, and those look to me like they might have been created just today. Well, frankly, the Bauhaus aesthetic is alive and well, and all you have to do is go to IKEA, and you can see the <laughs> the most recent ramifications of the Bauhaus aesthetic. Um, what really happened as a result of the war is that the idea became um, about making things that are economical. Germany was destroyed. Germany was in deeply impoverished. People starved to Bread death. Lines Bread were, lines. Yes, all the money that they had to use was so worthless that people used it to put as wallpaper on their home and their houses because it was it it was worth less than wallpaper. It was a terrible, terrible time. Literally, people starved, and people actually starved at the Bauhaus. Students came to the Bauhaus, and they mm -hmm. actually had a garden there. Um, but they developed a way of making art, and and in this case, design the beautiful. This happens to be a woman. Yes, it is. Uh -huh. She was a student at uh -huh. the Bauhaus and became a teacher, uh, stayed long enough to become one of the teachers. And uh, the idea was to make a prototype. And she made a beautiful prototype in silver, which is what you see here. And then it could be, it could be produced in various ways. It could be produced in silver. It could be produced in silver plate. If it, it could be produced in a metal, which was just a metal, a nice shiny silvery metal, but it wasn't really silver. Um, so it, you, depending upon your income bracket, you could buy that same design, but in different degrees of preciousness. Well, and you know, we need to look at another Kandinsky that's a little bit different and 
takes us from the earlier one that we saw to now. Mm -hmm. And I and, and there I it is. Think, yeah. <laughs> I, frankly, I like the other one better. Well, this one, this later Kandinsky, now this is a piece that he did while at the Bauhaus, while, while teaching painting mm -hmm. at the Bauhaus as a member of the, of the faculty, and it was a very esteemed pac faculty, I might add. Um, what he is bringing to it now is lessons that he learned while he was in, back in his home of Russia. He, is, uh, he was born in Russia, he grew up in Moscow, came to Munich. And when the war broke out, of course, when Russia entered the war against Germany, he was an enemy combatant. Yeah. He had to leave. See, all these people were just. They were all displaced yeah. and went flying back in different directions. And he had to go back to Moscow. When he went back to Moscow, he got reconnected with the art scene there, which was very much now, again, 1917, this, yeah. the Russian Revolution yeah. had occurred, and now it's the USSR. And so there was a new aesthetic there as well, and it was really did about... Did he fit in with that? Yes, he jumped right into the But, but into did the his art fit in with the... the his, his organic expressionist oh. art did not, and he changed tunes. He adopted the aesthetic of the constructivists and the suprematists who like were making this, art at that like moment. Like this piece. Like that piece. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very geometric. Flexibility is the yes. name of the game. Well, <laughs> and it, it was a new time. It was a new era, yeah. and being in the Soviet Union was a new adventure. It was a new experiment. No one had ever done that before. Yeah. Um, so big. Well, exactly. Mm -hmm. I think um, the next one that we want to talk about is Juan Gris. Mm -hmm. And he was around 1913. So we, you know, we're skipping a we're bit. We're jumping back and forth a yeah, little bit. Yeah, a little bit, mm -hmm. but. Um, this painting is from 1915. So it was painted while World War I was going on. Remember, World War I began in 1914. He was Spanish, so right. he could continue to paint. He, was, he continued to live in Paris. He continued to make paintings. Spain was neutral. Now he was a cubist. He was a cubist. So, and so, a, a, as opposed to the expressionist point of view, which was very organic and dramatic and expressive gestures, the Cubists were looking at other ideas about uh, reality, and they were resp responding to new notions of time and space. They were not reading Einstein, but it, this sorts of, these <laughs> yeah. sorts of ideas were in the air, and people were talking about the fact that there, how can you separate time from space, really it's a continuum. And so the idea that you would make a still life, and the word for still life in French is nature morte, dead nature, which means that it's absolutely still and holding, holding in place, that that was a fallacy, that that was not a reality, that in fact everything was shifting. And so what you see here is you know, glasses and newspapers and a coffee grinder and uh, Venetian blinds, and it's all in motion. Now, did he have any influence on Picasso? Well, he, Picasso, it's the other way around. Picasso, Picasso had, had influence, influence on, on him. him. See, I get my dates uh -huh. twisted around. Thank in you. fact, they, yeah. their families knew each other in uh -huh. Spain, and so when mm -hmm. young Juan Gris was going to come, wanted to go to Paris, of course, they put, put him together with Picasso. He lived in the same building with Picasso, and so forth. So the inoculation occurred. Yes. <laughs> he became part of the Cubist entourage. Well, we have a photograph Important. that's kind mm -hmm. of interesting, too. I, um, Photography has really found it come into its own of recent, but this is an older one, mm -hmm. and this almost looks cubist as well. Well, it's a, it's a variant of cubism. This is Alvin Langdon Coburn, who is an American artist, a photographer, but who went to Great Britain and he lived most of his life in Britain, and he became a member of what it was called the Vorticist Group, or and this is called a Vortograph. Mm -hmm. And so it's a photograph, it's taken with a camera, but it's a very unconventional approach. It's not that he set something out there and took a picture of it. What he did was he created a little kind of a window of fragments of mirrors that he oh. attached to the end of his lens, and he took a picture of that. Oh, and well, so that's, that's nice. what you're looking at, and what you see sort is of like very a kaleidoscope? Cute. kind of like that. Mm -hmm. It's uh, analogous mm -hmm. to something like that. Uh -huh. But it's not a picture of diamonds or metal or anything like that that would be out in the world, it was right around the frame of his lens. I think that's kind of It's a fantastic piece. And the vorticists were very active at the same time that the cubists Cubism. were, as well as the futurists. And like the futurists, they had a, a greater sense of dynamism. Are the Dada the Dadaists a futurist? The Dadaists are a separate category entirely. Right. You can see all these little movements that were right. happening. I Dada, mean, it was a busy little time. It was a very, very... <laughs> cacophonic time, let's <laughs> put it that way. Many different voices speaking yeah. simultaneously, but the Dadaists were interested in, um, well, actually what they were responding to was the war and the absurdity of the notion that supposedly civilized nations could come to this end. 
you know, the borders closed up when they could before freely, they were back and forth to Paris, and they were off to Barcelona, they were back and forth on to Munich, back to Berlin, and so forth. It was a world of no borders, and suddenly you're locked in. Uh, to where you are. And they didn't like that. Well, they, most, uh, some of them, and where Dada really took off, they, a lot of them went to Switzerland. It was neutral. Mm -hmm. Switzerland was a neutral country. And not altogether they went as an en masse, but they kind of found each other there in Zurich. I think mm -hmm. and if, if you want to take the time to um, look up the Dada movement, uh, Man Ray would be a good one too. He would be one. I would just say, look up Google Dada in <laughs> Google Dada, and you will find all about. Um, you know, that some of the artists uh, of this era did not end well. They were some of them were plagued with mental illness. Mm -hmm. Some of them um, had to flee to their other country. It was it was a terrible upheaval mm -hmm. for them as well. It was. Oh. It was, in fact, very sad. Very sad, and I'm just, I just—I made myself some notes here so I could just remind everyone uh, what happened here. You know, who who fought in the war? Who died? What happened to people? So, Paul Clay who was from Switzerland, but was of German extraction. Served in the war. Franz Mark, a German artist, part of the Blaue Reiter movement, the Blue Rider in Munich, was served in the war for Germany. Was killed at Verdun. August Maka also served in the war. Georges Brock from France served in the war, was wounded. Uh, Ernst Ludwig Kirchner suffered, also for, uh, fought for Germany, but suffered a mental collapse, what we would call um, post-traumatic stress disorder today. We have different names for things. And then, of course, Egon Schiele died just, as just a few weeks before the war ended in 1918, along with his wife, and she was pregnant, and also their child. I think it's appropriate, as I say thank you to you for this wonderful conversation about the show at the Nelson. Please go see it. I want to quote the poem that you quoted in the paper by uh, Miss Estes. She wrote in The Splendor, and her poem is about the artists who create in times of upheaval. And she said, what if incubation can only occur in darkness? What if hope and new life that truly endure are not born from airy happiness but from the black dirt of grief. And there Profound you have it. Profound statements. It is. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Jan. Thank you, Mary. And I have to thank the Nelson Atkins Museum of Art for making us the loan of your wonderful conversation. Oh, it's today. great to be here. You have to come see the exhibition oh, again absolutely. and again. Again and again. <laughs> and I urge you all to go and see it. As I say, thanks so much for being with us. And we'll be back again soon because it's our community. <laughs>